On today's show, we break down what we heard and what we think came out of Craig Berube's introductory press conference to the Toronto media. You're listening to the Lockdown Leafs podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network. It's your team every day. Your Locked On Maple Leafs, your daily podcast on the Toronto Maple Leafs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome into the Locked On Leafs podcast, a daily Maple Leafs centric podcast hosted by myself, Mike DiStefano, and my co-host, Dave Morissuti. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 with any winning $5 bet. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. It's going to be a grind. My voice, as everyone can tell, very hoarse. Very hoarse. Uh, Celebrated my birthday over the weekend. And once you get to the dirty 30, they say it's a multi-day recovery. My problem is I think I strained my vocal cords from like yelling and singing too loud. We were playing a bunch of the old oldies, uh, you know, like our, our high school elementary school hits. And, uh, you know, I was I was having a good time. Good time. Still paying for it a couple of days later, Dave. Well, so, as I joined you on the 30 Club myself. Yes, you did. Happy birthday to Dave as well. Yeah. And. I, I did not go as hard on you on the parting, but I did get some lavish gifts. And there was one Ooh. I want to show you because I yes. know this is something you will appreciate a lot. Oh, this is heavy. I keep forgetting how heavy this is. Oh, my goodness. The yeah. World Championship belt, like the old school Eagle belt. Yep. We need Where'd you get that from? Well, you know, we have some good buddies of ours who are big wrestling fans. Yeah. Oh, Jose, and- get that for you? Yep, he like crew, tracked. Group. Yeah, crew grabbed it, tracked it down. <laughs> Every time, like I, it was uh, passing around to people, they're like, "Holy crap, this thing is heavy!" So well, now I think it's got like the plate. I mean, it's not real gold, obviously, but like it's it's metal, heavy man. metal yeah. plate. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's cool. That's cool. I remember for Christmas one year, back when they had the the WWE store in Niagara Falls, I did yeah, get like a little that. like a little kids one with like the mm-hmm. Niagara Falls belt on it, but it was like. A similar looking title, and uh, I think I still have it to this day somewhere, somewhere at my parents' place. Um, all right, let's get to it because there's a lot to get into today, oh, yeah. Dave. Uh, the Maple Leafs announced Craig Berube as the team's 32nd head coach in franchise history today. Well, the announcement was made a couple days ago, but he was introduced to Toronto media today. Uh, we finally got to hear from Craig Berube. We heard from um, the general manager, Brad Tree Living. Brendan Shanahan was also there and had some remarks. Also in attendance was uh, Keith Pelly, which I actually kind of liked to see. I mean, that's, you know, it, again, no one's really been in that position for a few years. But it's good to see, you know, like the synergy with all four of those guys and the accountability. Like he's there, so he's holding himself accountable by being there. He was part of, you know, the the selection process, I'm sure, or at least had some sort of part in it. And he's there to make the hire. He's there to welcome Baruby into the family, and he's taking accountability uh, and, and keeping everyone accountable. And hopefully, that kind of trickles down. And when we talk about the big takeaways that we had from uh, today's press conference. I mean, that's kind of the buzzword that I think we heard the most, wouldn't you say? Accountability? I think so. Accountability. Uh, I mean, how many times did you hear Brad Children talk about, we, you know, getting a voice, character? Character was a big one, too. Team first mentality. Yeah. Like, if people are making good points. It's like, how much maybe was this brought up in exit meetings, potentially with... Uh, with Brad living from players who are not as viewed as a core part of the team. Right. Um, I, I, yeah, I think Bru- he's, it, it, they tried very hard to get certain things out of him. And one thing I think you're going to appreciate about Craig Brubit is he's going to, he's going to be direct, but he's also knows where he needs to toe the line. Cause there are questions being asked about the goaltending about certain players. He know, yep. He knows when he when he has to say something, and uh, yeah, he. 
I think you're going to be seeing a lot of that in his tenure here for sure. Yeah, he he didn't he wasn't afraid of the no comment comment. We'll say that no. wasn't afraid no. to make that. Which you know, Toronto sometimes you, you gotta you gotta do that because everything you say is going to be picked apart. Now that's not going to always work, especially midway through the season. There are certain you know obligations that coaches have. I would say asking someone on the first day to get the job, hey, what's your goaltending looking like? It's like I don't know. <laughs> like he, I don't even think he would have had an answer. Uh, even if he did, what's going to say, oh, we're going to go ahead and trade for Jacob Markstrom. We're going to trade for Jordan Bennington. Like, well, how was he going to answer that question? But to your mm -hmm. point, um, didn't have an issue. Just basically shrugging off the question and, and not, you know, not putting himself uh, in a corner by trying to have to tiptoe something. Just straight up said, that's ah, not for today. Uh, I, that's not what we're going to be talking about today. So like that, that directness uh, mm -hmm. is, is what I like. And, you know, people, you look at how Keith kind of ended up handling the media. And that was something that I think was probably, you know, one of his weak spots as a coach was trying to handle media, handle the players within the media, speak through to players through the media. You know, so if Craig Berube, um, someone asked him, like, you know, how are you going to deal with it? And he basically said, I've been coaching for a long time and that's not really my forte. Like I, I usually keep things internal. I'll, I'll let players know when things are going on. I don't need to send messages through the media. And I kind of appreciate that. Um, I wish sometimes I'm sure, you know, we're not going to like it as much as media members because we, we need that type of content yep. to give us show content realistically, just being selfish, but keeping that type of culture and keeping things tight knit and, and inside uh, the organization. Um, I, I think that's probably a good thing. I, I think, you know, for, for the manager, they're going to love that. <laughs> like front office is going to love not having to deal with the coach throwing guys under the bus unneededly. You know, he did, but do you look back on his time in St. Louis, his famous clip was when he was saying, you know, these guys are paying millions of dollars. They need to go out there and play with pride. But that's just a, the whole team he's calling out. He's not going to – like some people think he's going to go the route of like torts and start throwing out guys in, in that regard. I don't think he's that type of coach. He will certainly send messages to players, but he, again, as you're saying, he's not going to be the one to go out to reports and being like, right. man, Nylander guy, I need more out of him. He needs to. He needs to pick things up. I don't see him doing that. Right. He's going to be more direct where he's going to walk up to Nylander or walk up to Morgan Riley and say, hey, this team needs you to step up. Like, we need you to do your job and do your role. And that was one thing, too, that I actually I, I really liked. Um, I think it was Rosie DeMano asked, asked a, a pretty good question that got a really good answer. Um, basically asked, you know, what what does a Craig Berube coach team look like? Like, what do you expect for them to to look like? And he said, uh, you know, he expects them to be competitive, to be team first. Everyone will have jobs and roles and they'll know it uh, in terms of, you know, how they'll play. He said they'll be a very north south team, very fast and heavy. They want to be strong on pucks. They want to be winning puck battles um, and, and structure, he said, was also big. He said that you've got to have it not just in the defensive zone, but you got to have structure in the offensive zone and in the neutral zone. So all three zones need to be structured uh, very, very well. So he's going to try and bring some structure to this group and try and get them playing north-south. And look, we watched the Stanley Cup playoffs right now. What do those teams look like? They look like north-south teams, right? Yep. Teams that are just – those guys are going northward all the time. They're playing heavy. They're big. They're fast. They're strong. They're, you know, digging for pucks all the time. And usually the team that comes away with it – uh, one more often than not at this point in the playoffs. So, you know, these are the, um, the, the these are like, this is what a, a good team should look like, I guess. Uh, the characteristics, that's what we're looking for. These are the characteristics of a winning team in modern day hockey. So whether or not, I mean, it, he's saying that's what he wants to get out of them. Now his job is to get the message through to the players. And that's kind of been the issue for many, many years. Because even Brad Tree Living today said, don't mistake in what we're saying here and what Baruby brings and the accountability and, you know, the the forwardness and, and the competitiveness. You know, don't mistake in that 
that, you know, we're replacing Sheldon because he didn't have any of that. And I want to bring that in. You know, he did note Sheldon's a very good coach. He believes Sheldon's going to go on to do good things. And he did have those qualities. Just the message wasn't getting through. The message got stale at some point, um, and they needed to bring in a fresh voice to try and get that message through in a different way. Very similar message, but just try a different way to get it through them. And that's why ultimately, uh, you know, we landed on on Craig Berube. Interesting note also, I was not aware. Uh, that was kind of a bombshell that uh, Tree Living admitted that they spoke with nine head coaches. Nine. We only heard of like two. Like I was so surprised. Why don't we take a quick break? We'll come back. You can give your thoughts on uh, that little bombshell that uh, that we heard. And I've got a couple of questions as for you know, do what did we learn from what was said today about uh, or from Craig Berube? Did we learn anything about maybe the direction of the team? We'll dive into that on the other side. And we're down to the final four in the Stanley Cup playoffs. So we'll kind of wrap up with our thoughts on the conference finals, maybe give our quick thoughts on last night's game seven. That was a terrific game. And we have a trade in the NHL as well that will inevitably impact the Maple Leafs. So we'll tell you about all that more on the other side. You're listening to the Locked On Leafs podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. It's winner take all in the NBA and NHL, and FanDuel is giving you a shot to bring home a big win of your own. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 to bet on spreads, money lines, player props, and more. You can visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make every playoff shot count. FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Welcome back into the Locked On Leafs podcast. Mike DiStefano and Dave Morissuti with you. We are your hosts here at Locked On Leafs. It's a daily Maple Leafs centric podcast. We've got new episodes coming out each and every weekday, Monday through Friday, wherever you get your podcast audio wise, whichever platform you use to stream or download them. And also up on YouTube, we would ask if you enjoy this video, uh, if you would click like, leave a comment down below your thoughts, anything you gleaned from the Craig Berube. Uh, press conference today and also uh, a subscribe would uh, would go a long way and help help our numbers all that would be great share it as well be a friend tell a friend about the locked on leaves podcast um so let's continue our kind of breakdown of what we uh heard from craig berube today uh well i guess we'll pick back up on the brad true living part of the conversation that we left with the fact that he revealed that they had spoke with as many as nine coaches. This was not information that we knew. Uh, there was really the only two names that got out there were Brad Tr- or were um, Craig Berube and Todd McClellan. Uh, there was rumors that they were going to try and talk to Rob Brenda Moore. Although I'm sure that talk did not go very long as Brenda Moore signed an extension in Carolina. Like, the same day that Perume basically signed in uh, in Toronto, so that probably didn't go very long. Um, I'm curious who else you know they they might have talked to, but did that surprise you that there was that expansive of uh, of a coaching search? I suppose. Absolutely. Like I, I know that they were gonna. He was. I know Brad Schilling was gonna be thorough about this, but there's like thorough, and then there's throwing like the kitchen sink at everything, right? I was well, trying I'm to. Just, okay. I would love to know who. The other candidates were probably yeah, Gallant. I would think he he did talk to Gallant then. I had to think of he talked to Gallant. Maybe he spoke to DJ Smith. You know, possibly. possibly. Uh, Don Granado in Buffalo would have to be another one. Uh, David Quinn, San Jose. Yeah. I wonder if Quenville was one. I right? I I'm surprised be- nobody asked about that. I maybe they didn't want to throw it up there. And they probably who they probably would get a no answer, but I'm a little surprised that that wasn't maybe potentially brought up. Yeah, maybe like as a side conversation, somebody might ask that, but I don't know. You wouldn't want to put Berube in a weird spot where it's like, oh yeah, we spoke to Quen Bill and he was our guy, but uh, he was unable to join us or something. You know, I mean? like he obviously wouldn't have said that, but yeah, I, I'm, who knows if Quenville was an option or not? Regardless. 
They ended up going with Craig Berube. He sounded like he was the front runner right from the get go, and he ends up getting uh, getting the job. Um, there seems to be a lot of uh, synergy though between Brad Tree Living and Craig Berube, uh, and, and kind of how the team should be built. And I think it allows this team to be able to create an identity for themselves. Like, do, do you feel like those two kind of feel like they are very much on the same page? And that's only going to benefit, I think, the roster construction. Therefore, the 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 you know future identity of what this team wants to become. I think so. I, I'm watching the the I watched that game seven or game six are between Dallas and Colorado, mm-hmm. and I was thinking to myself, man, I don't think the Leafs could have could have stayed with Dallas the way Dallas was playing, the pace they were playing, even Colorado. That was, I think, like when you hear what Craig Brube was talking about in terms of the style that he wants his team to play. Look at those teams, north south, like they were going with speed. They were just bulldozing through the neutral zone. Like it's none of this. I uh, will go to the side. Oh, maybe we'll try this side. We'll try to tiptoe around. No, like these guys are going straight through. It doesn't matter who's in front of them. And yeah, I'm looking at them like back, playing fast. Yeah, like when and everyone thinks they like playing heavy means like hit everything in sight. No, it just means you're gonna play with a little more purpose, right? The the pace is a big part of it too, right? When the reason why dump and dump and chase works for some of these teams is because they are dumping it with a guy who has already a head start to go in and get after the puck, not guys waiting at the blue line. The puck is chipped in, and then okay, now I'm gonna go and get it. That's not how right. teams that run the dump and chase operate. Right. And even Barube, like he basically said today, he essentially broke it down. He was like, playing heavy doesn't necessarily mean we got to be like, you know, a bunch of Ryan Reeves out there. Like, yeah, Reeves is obviously on this team and he'll probably play a role um, similarly to the way he did last year. But it's more so being just, you know, strong on pucks. It's more so, you know, like you said, chipping in and then winning that puck battle in the corner to keep possession or winning the puck battle in behind the net and getting it up and getting it out really quickly and transitioning up the ice. Like that's what it means to play, to play heavy, right? If you're bearing in on the net, put your shoulder down and try and take it to the net instead of trying to stop up or, you know, trying to to float it back and flip it to the other side of the ice, like play with purpose, which again is something that Sheldon Keefe did try and get out of this team. Mm -hmm. It just for whatever reason never got through. So I, I think there's a lot of um I mean uh, this is an obvious statement. It's 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 not you know anything that is going to be you know uh, that hasn't been said before, but I think there is a lot of um this is the word I'm looking for here. Uh, uh I'm, I'm blanking on the word here, Dave. I'm blanking on the word here. Like it, there, there's going to be a lot of responsibility, I guess, for the Maple Leafs to get it done. Uh, onus. That's not, huh? Maybe onus. I don't know, but like, it, it's on them now, right? Like, yeah. it's, it's only, like they're on their third coach. At this point, it's on them to to get it done, right? So that that's that's the way it is. They they got to figure out a way to listen to Berube and you know play the systems that they want him to play and, and, and get it done. Um, there was one other thing that I, I, I really kind of took out of today's press conference, and that was uh, the communication part that Craig Berube talked about and how that's how he believes he's been able to hold players accountable throughout his career. And it's through forming kind of a partnership with the players you know, forming uh, a good relationship with them and having that good open line of communication. Part of that is being able to, you know, tell a guy, uh, you know, tell it how it is, ultimately, not beat around a bush. And I I think Craig Berube is going to be able to bring that. The question is, like, does that fit with some of the guys on this this group? Like, even Brad Trilliving brought up the – and just to – kind of piggyback that talk about partnerships and communications and having roles and jobs and responsibilities. Brad Trilving kind of piggybacked that and talked about the importance of the team, the Toronto Maple Leafs. He tried to do this a year ago as well. 
And he said, like, it's not about one, two, three, four, five guys, the core three, four, five, whatever. Like, that's what he said. So it's about the Maple Leafs and the ability to build and connect a team together. Uh, they have to be able to connect. Uh, you have to be able to connect with people to hold them accountable. And I'm hoping that is what Craig Berube will be able to come and do. And Berube mentioned the word ice time. He said, if that means, you know, limiting ice time or so be it, blah, 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 and went on to another diatribe. And that was kind of a, I don't know, like my ears perked up when I heard that because I'm like, okay, that is something that we did not see from Sheldon Keep a whole lot. And it was always very much coddling, especially to the, the, the big boys, the, the core four, as we called it, the core five, whatever it is. Um, it, that's not going to be the case here with, with Berube. I think that's for the better, the betterment of the team, uh, betterment of the organization, I am curious how it's going to mesh with certain players, though. Well, that's the thing, right? I think that's going to be the big part of the next week is, I mean, he's he's already said that he's spoken to most of the players on the team. So I'm sure he's gotten a bit of a sense of kind of where players stand on certain things. But I think this is where the, the, like, let's let's not forget, Craig Rube was working for TNT during the playoffs. So he's watched this Leafs team play. He knows kind of areas that he can pinpoint to the front office. I mean, you sure that's already been part of the interview process. But I think now the next week is going to be determining, okay, do we have do we have the horses to get this done? Or do we have to make some changes to bring in more of what we need to make this kind of work the way Craig Bruby thinks it needs to be needs to work? Right. Exactly. So uh, it'll be interesting, and obviously everyone's kind of pointing at one player um, more so than than the rest. Not that there's only one guy, but you know, Mitch Marner is a, is the, the name that keeps popping up, and whether or not you know Mitch Marner and it will be able to coexist with just the way that he's kind of I don't know. It, it, it's not that I believe he's put himself above the team, but like Mitch Marner always kind of it it seemed like Mitch wanted to get Mitch. You know, like Mitch is going to get his type type of deal. Uh, whether that's fair, I, I don't know, honestly. But that's just how it's kind of looked or it's been portrayed over the last few years. So can Mitch buy into that? And the first, the only way I see him proving to not only the coach, the new coach, the general manager, but also Keith Pelly and the organization and the fan base that he can buy into that the only way I really see it happening is if he he takes a discount, Dave, and not like a major discount, but like maybe re-upping at the exact same price or re-upping at like ten million instead of trying to get as much money as possible. That's how you can prove I am a team guy. Like I didn't live up to my last contract, so I'll leave a little bit on the table to make up for it on this next one. Like outside of that, I'm not sure if Marner will really be able to like show everybody. That, uh, that that he can't buy into that team mentality. Well, and that and like he constantly says, I want to be here. This is where I want to be. Okay, it's one thing to say it. Now show it, right? Yeah. He, some may say, oh, but you know, he went and, and played on the penalty kill. He became a more defensively reliable player. That's good and all, but it's also part of the reason why he felt like he was owed more money is because he was doing all of those things. I think with when it comes to Marner, there's yeah the next like that's I think Brad Chilvin has already kind of said some of that, but also when you look at the Neilander and Matthews contracts, it makes you wonder if does he how much does he truly believe that because he gave them increase like I think Matthews has shown more of that leadership. Everyone thinks he's even deserving to be the captain. Neilander. I think that was obviously a tough one because you you're walking him to free agency, but Marner's a different case in my opinion, because everyone's now talking about how there's like little to no chance he's back. Yeah. Did you hear, um, uh, who was it? I was, I was, I saw on a podcast, Frank Saravalli. He said it was like a five, less than a 5% chance, which. Yeah. Yeah. He said, I think there's a 5% chance. Marner is a Maple Leaf next year. That's a direct quote from Frank Cervelli's mouth on the DFO rundown pod the other night. So, and like Cervelli's pretty plugged in, man. So he, he, 
is either hearing rumblings that they are trying to move on from him, uh, that it's just not going to work. So if he's giving it a, a, a 5% chance, that's, that's pretty damning. It, 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 here's the weird thing about Marner, though, not to go off on a long tangent that doesn't necessarily – it kind of does have to do with today's conversation. But what's weird is, is like, he's afraid in the offensive zone. Like, not afraid, but that's where – I think we often pick him apart is in the offensive zone instead of the defensive zone, which is usually the opposite for like star prolific wingers like him. Like it's always the offensive part of the game that we, we miss come playoff time. Right. It's like, we never worry about the defense because we know that it's, that it's there, but typically with a star winger, it's like, yeah, okay. He scores goals, but like, you know, the guy's a liability defensively. That's not the case with Marner. He actually does play with good structure at his own end and he plays well defensively which you would think Baruby would like and, and want to see um, out of his players. Um, but for me, I think it's more so like the, uh, like the, the, those muffin backhand drop passes or the, the, the tries the, the cute little touch passes that consistently cause turnovers. Like those little plays, I think he was up there in the league in terms of turning the puck over in the defensive end. I can look up that stat in a second uh, once you kind of take the reins here. But I think those are the types of things that dro drove Keith kind of nuts and will drive Baruby kind of nuts where it's like, okay, we need to just you know play simple. Do do the simple things. A proper pass, right? Let's, let's make sure your passes have purpose. Don't just drop something randomly at your blue line have it picked off and going the other way like that's not what we need to see so like that's the type of stuff i think that really kind of is, is gonna that does annoy coaches um so it's not that marner i don't know it's it's just it's really bizarre that we sit here we pick on marner and we pick on him and it's like oh he he's not gonna fit with craig baruby but it's like well he might because he is a defensive guy like he's a selkie candidate you would think he would like that but there are other parts of the game that make you pull your hair out sometimes uh, when it comes to this guy, including the lack of offense come playoff time, which he's paid to get and hasn't come through in eight years, eight years, Dave. I think for me, it's more so the lack of pace at times too. Like uh, Mitch, I, I just remember watching Mitch a few years ago. I remember like even that game where they played Carolina, the next gen game, where he scores right off the drop, draw because he's a guy that can get up the ice quickly and pull the move on the goaltender. I didn't see that in the playoffs because guess what? Mm -hmm. In the playoffs, your time and space gets taken away, right? And he's all, trying to do east, west, and all perimeter stuff. Yeah. He's not going north, right? south. He's not going. He's not. He's not willing to go to the net, and that's what drives people nuts, right? Is when that's why a lot of people like William Nylander. William Nylander, especially this year, he was about driving to the net. He was about going to the scoring areas. Now, is he still a little bit on the perimeter in terms of when he has the puck in the offensive zone? Yes, I, I do believe so. That's not going to happen under Craig Brubick. He is going to tell guys, and he's going to make that apparent from day one. Um, now, I'm not saying, again, Sheldon Keefe, I think, made that known. I watched that Amazon. I keep bringing this up, but I watched the Amazon documentary. He literally said, are we getting to the areas we need to get to to score? And this was uh, this was before the playoffs. Like This mm -hmm. was during the season. He recognized it, but it's one thing to recognize it. It's another to get the message through. I yep. think that's for Brad Living's whole idea of, yeah, Craig, like, it's, he's going to come at it differently than Sheldon. It will be a di he'll take a different direction than Sheldon. I think that's what the uh, that's why I think the Leafs felt like they needed to make that move, just to have somebody that can articulate it in the way that this team needs it to be articulated. Yep. No, I completely agree. Uh, I, I think that's that is what this team does need to uh, need to do here. So I, I have the numbers uh, in terms of defensive zone giveaways. So. Mitch had 20 defensive zone giveaways. He had 60 giveaways overall this year, which among forwards was 17th. He also had 20 defensive zone giveaways. But keep in mind, he only played 69 games or everyone else played like 
between 75 and, and a full right. 82 game season. So, no, he was he was up there when it came to to giveaways and giveaways in the defensive uh, end as well. Anyways, this wasn't uh, a, a you know crap on Marner uh, episode, so I apologize for going there. But I think it's interesting when we talk about you know is 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 Baruby going to want to move forward with this guy? And you think about his strengths and weaknesses. You know, there's some things he's going to like, and there's some things he might not like. So it's going to be interesting to see what Baruby will want to do with a, a player like Mitch Marner. Cause look, he said, I came here because of the talented players. That's what attracted me here to Toronto. Mitch Marner is a talented player. No one can dispute that. Um, so it, it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting to see what ends up happening there. Um, although Saravalli's kind of 5% chance quote there makes it feel like the, the decision might already be made and uh, we'll see what happens. All right, Dave, on the other side, uh, let's come back and quickly just tee up the conference finals. They are set. The final four uh, is is set. And, um, well, well, we'll basically just make our predictions. Who do we think are going to represent the conferences in the Stanley Cup finals? So that's coming up on the other side. It's Mike Stefano, Dave Moore, Studio. You're listening to the Locked On Lease Podcast, part of Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team every day. Welcome back into the Locked On Leafs podcast. Mike DiStefano and Dave Morissuti. The final four is set, Dave. The conference finals are officially uh, set tomorrow night. Things kick off with the Eastern Conference final with the Rangers and the Panthers. And then uh, they'll alternate every other night with the Edmonton Oilers and the Dallas Stars. So those are the four teams that have made it into the final four. Um, who do you like? Let's start with the Edmonton Dallas series. Who do you like getting through and representing the West in the cup final? Oh, I'm all on the Dallas stars. That is a team top to bottom that has everything going. Look, they just beat the reigning cup champs from the last two years. That that's, I think is given everyone. A, no, I would say an eyebrow raise. Cause I think Dallas was always that team that from last year is like, this team's ready to take another step. And the emergence of young guys like Wyatt Johnson, Logan Stan Coven, Jake Onder has been back to being, you know, Thomas Harley too. Yeah. Defensively, he's been yeah. a beast. Like it, they just are so deep. I look back to the Edmonton. Like, yeah, they did a good job defensively of really um, restricting what Vancouver was doing. But I hate to say it, like I mean, as good as she loves was for Vancouver. He's not Jake Ottinger, right? This is a Vancouver team that did not get the best out of their best players. Edmonton had a little bit to do with that, but I also they also didn't have Brock Besser. They didn't have Thatcher Demko. Those are huge losses. And think uh, like as, uh, Besser was there for six. Yeah, years. For, until the final game. And like crazy how that all ended for him. Very unfortunate. Yeah. Um, but like Edmonton barely won those games. Like even that game seven, even that game seven where they won it. They, they, Vancouver was able to make a light, late charge. You got, if you have an opportunity to put a team away, you got to. And I don't think Dallas is going to give Edmonton that, that time and space. They know how to deal with star players. They just did it against Colorado. And I think you're going to see that again in this Western Conference. Yeah. Up until game five, I think like McKinnon, Ranson, McCarr were all very much held in check. Yeah. Uh, and then they had a really good game five to force a game six. But then in game six, Dallas was like, nah, we're just not going to give you anything. We're going to win this game two one in overtime. Um, I'm with you though. I'm, I'm, I'm Dallas all the way. I've had Dallas as my cup pick literally since the beginning of the, the playoffs. And I had Dallas and the Rangers actually as my cup yeah. pick since the beginning of the playoffs. So that's, that's still alive for me. Um, so I still think that Dallas uh, has a really strong chance to get it done. Funny enough, they are. Uh, I think Edmonton is actually favored in the series. On they are, which I'm. Yeah, I'm surprised. Well, it, so I wonder if it's just based on Edmonton being the more popular team, like that. Well, they've sometimes... also got the best player in the NHL on them. Like, sure, that's... sure. Wait, are they favored in the series? 
the last I checked, they were, but maybe they've maybe FanDuel has changed the odds on that. Uh, well, just because I see that the Stars are second now to win the Cup at plus two thirty, so I think that they're actually they're probably the. Uh... Yeah, okay, yeah. So yeah, it's flipped. So the Stars are the betting they favorite are. at minus one twenty five. The Oilers at plus one hundred four. So that, both of us think that. That'll probably uh, that'll probably come to fruition with Dallas winning that one. Panthers, Rangers. Uh, I like the underdog in this one because the Rangers are the underdogs here against the Panthers, who are favored at minus one forty six. So people think it's a stronger chance that the pant like a pretty strong chance that the Panthers are going to roll through the New York Rangers. But I mean, similar to Dallas, I think New York's just built well. Like they've got the goaltending, they've got excellent D, and they've got you know some guys who are scoring, like Chris Kreider. Like that guy is, is a scoring machine right now. You've got Alexi Lafreniere averaging a point per game. You've got Trocheck scoring, Zabenajad. Like they've got guys all the way down their lineup. Uh, Panarin, maybe you mentioned Panarin for Pete's sake. Probably their best, most talented offensive weapon. Um, I, I like the Rangers in this series to set up a Dallas Rangers final. I, I just think that um, when you when you stack up Florida and New York, I like a lot of what New York has. Like Shesterkin has been awesome in Dude, the playoffs, unreal, unreal. And again, like I think Bobrovsky's been good, but he has been Bobrovsky from last year, which I think it would have been very hard for him to replicate that. And then, yeah, I think the Rangers have more horses on that team, right? Like again, I don't know it. If the Florida Panthers have had a lot of injuries to deal with. Um, like even Matt Kachuk hasn't. Ex- I'm mean, going to say this now, and he's probably going to go off in this series. But Kachuk hasn't exactly been superstar level throughout these plays. He's been good, right? But I, I just think that the, this Boston series kind of exposed a little bit of where where Florida's weaknesses are up front. The the, the depth of scoring hasn't really been there. Last year was also the stars that carried that team. So if you're looking going star for star power, the Rangers can definitely do that against uh, against the Panthers, unlike the Bruins, who just didn't couldn't match up, especially when they lost Marshawn. All right. So officially the locked on these pod jumping on the I guess stars bandwagon. Well, not bandwagon, but we believe the stars are gonna win in the West. We believe the Rangers are gonna win in the East, setting up a Dallas. Rangers final. Let us know who you think is going to win in the comments down below. Really quick before we uh, before we take off. Actually, two quick notes before we take off. Uh, I'm going to uh, uh, we're going to play a quick game, Dave. We're going to play a quick game. Okay. Yep. How many former Maple Leafs can you name that are still in the Stanley Cup playoffs in 30 seconds? Okay. Time out. I'll give you a three count. I'll start. And then you're gonna just start naming, naming names, okay? So, one, two, three. Thirty seconds starts now. Mason Marchment, Zach Hyman, Cody CC. Technically, Jack Campbell's still there. Carter Verhage. Uh, Twenty seconds left. Oh, I gotta think. I gotta think. Gotta think. Gotta think. I. Uh, any on? Any more on the Panthers? No. Oh, uh, Jimmy VC. Five seconds. And I'll end. I'll end it there. That's how many I can think of. Oh. I, I think they get seven. They got seven. How many? You got half. You got half. There was fourteen. There's fourteen. Fourteen still kicking around. Uh, Mason Marchment. Yeah. Hyman. Cece. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sam Carrick. Oh, I forgot. Oh, God. Yeah, Connor right. Brown. Oh, I I literally was Calvin talking about Pickard. Oh um, god, Jack yeah, Campbell. Man. I if funny that I think of back, of Jack Campbell before Calvin Pickard. Well, so this okay, this so 13 and a half, okay? Cuz I'm going to go Sam Gagne who like was oh, technically a Marley. Yeah. It, it doesn't have to count. It doesn't have to count, but he was technically in the Maple Leafs organization as a Marley. Evan Rodriguez Technically, was a Toronto Maple Leaf pending UFA, but he was a Toronto Maple Leaf, so that is technically correct. 
Uh, Jimmy VC, Nick Patan is on the Rangers. Oh, my technically. God. Riley Nash is also a New York Ranger. Oh, and my God. I forgot about that trade. Eric Gustafson. Okay, Eric. I should have remembered that one. Yeah, Eric Gustafson also on the Rangers. So, uh, I mean, 12 to 14. It depends if you want to count. I got uh, the big can. hitters. That's who I got. <laughs> you did get the big hitters. You, you got the I, – honestly, I would have froze up and probably named, like, Hyman well, Marchment, and then I just would have went blank. CC so, and – yeah, so you 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 did good. You got you got at least. I should have remembered Con- Connor Brown's one. I I wish I would have remembered because maybe he might, that be a buy, he might be a buy low, bring back candidate in the off season. Just gonna put that out there. Could be, could be. Yeah, I mean, could always use guys who don't score on Toronto for sure. Oh yeah, absolutely. But he'll uh, play. He, he's a Brew Bay guy. <laughs> telling you, we'll see. We'll see what happens there. Uh, really quickly, trade to announce in the NHL. Just uh, like 20 minutes before we start started to record the podcast, it was announced that the Lightning have reacquired Ryan McDonough, defenseman Ryan McDonough, back to Tampa Bay. That Lightning D has not been the same since they traded him away to make room for cap space to sign a whole bunch of dudes. And uh, – I gotta tell you, it, it, there's still not a lot of cap space there. They literally like, have no cap space, <laughs> and, and they have 18 players. Mean for Steven Stamkos. Mm-hmm. And it's funny that pretty much the Predators rented McDonough for two years for uh, Philip Myers and some other forward, and they got a second round pick back out of all of that. That trade made no sense. Like. Well, it did make sense, but then the Lightning could have bought out Myers and got cap uh, cap space cap space by buying him out, like he was a cap surplus. Yeah, and they didn't do that. Instead, they put him in the minors, and he counted like against the cap, and uh, it made no sense to me what the hell they did with that Phil Myers thing. I remember we were talking about it on the show, it was like Toronto should trade for Phil Myers and then buy him out. You could literally gain like an extra eight hundred thousand in cap space by doing it, and they didn't do it. Um, but yeah, Ryan McDonough back on the lightning and, uh, Hey, McDonough and Victor Hedman was a scary, scary blue line combination back in the day. So uh, Predators also opening up a little cap space, just gonna throw it out there. Oh, getting some assets. I did not put that together. Are you suggesting they're going to be big players this off season? If, if it's. They, got, they had nine picks, nine picks in this draft. Well, I will say, I think uh, they do have some dead cap this offseason. Yeah, they do. They have the, they have Duchesne, like eight million, eight million. Yeah, and Johansson. No, well, Johansson's done. Oh, is he done? That was, that was a retained salary trade. Oh, right, right, right. Okay. And he's done after but this Duchesne year. But Duchesne was bought out, right? And Kyle Turris is still on the books. Oh, my God. So I think it's close oh. to $8 million in dead cap this off season. That's funny. They're involved in literally like the same trade. And yep. now, they're both <laughs> yep. now they're both being paid not to play for the team that traded for them. Yeah. So like, I don't know how much relief they really get from this deal though. Cause they, they've got that much money in dead cap now. I don't know, but uh, yeah. So that's, that's uh, the first trade of the off season, I guess. The Maple Leafs mm-hmm. did mention that they will be spending the next week talking with their amateur and pro scouts to see what they want to do with the roster going forward. Obviously, Craig Berube is going to be around, and he'll be a big part of those conversations as well as they try and shape the team uh, into you know what they think is uh, is a Stanley Cup winning group. So you know, over the next few days, Dave, I think you and I can kind of take a look at this team, take a look at what the cap situation's like, the pending UFAs. Who do they bring back? Who do they let walk? And uh, we can start attacking the offseason ourselves. So that's what we'll have planned for uh, the, the next couple of weeks here on the Locked On Lease podcast. But that'll do it for us here today on the show. I'd like to thank you all for listening and supporting the podcast. You can subscribe to the Locked On Lease podcast on all platforms and receive daily Leafs content. Follow myself on X at Mickey underscore Canuck. Follow Dave at D underscore more studio follow show as well at Locked On Leafs. We'll be back with another episode for you guys tomorrow. But until then, keep it locked right here on Locked On Leafs.